Welcome to this episode about Bayesianism, which is a specific approach to the relationship between the data you have and the truth you dare to derive from it. And I know we are going into a lot of really small details and it might be a lot of long theory, which is a bit ironic when we are promoting simplicity. Uh, I'm aware of that, but uh, where would you else go and spend half an hour to uh, get a very clear explanation and understanding of the fundamentals of probability theory and how that relates to statistics? And given that you want to understand what science is, this is a really central understanding. So um, please stick with this and, um, and get a really clear understanding on the relationship between probability theory, statistics, and how that relates to the relationship between data collection and truth and evidence. The empiricists would say that a theory is good if its conceptual assumptions rest firm on first principles and are rooted in experience described well enough for anybody to repeat the same experience and come to the same conclusions. Karl Popper was in the other extreme, claiming that a theory, theory would never be proven, but only increased in validity every time it was not disproven. The modern evidence concepts of science is based on probability theory, where you acknowledge that you can't really prove a theory, but you can calculate probabilities for different outcomes and use those probabilities to, de to determine what you believe to be true, given the results you see in your experiments. The first important concept to understand is the importance of the samples, or the important of the sample. And I think the most useful concept to understand in statistics is the idea of the creation of a sample that is expected to relate to a background phenomena or phenomena of interest. So you take out a sample to say something about a bigger system. The beauty is that you can measure the sample and use your calculations on the sample to predict something about the, the larger system you have taken the sample from. Specifically, you want to measure and predict a parameter of the larger system. You can take a sample of Danish people and test how well headache medicine is working on, say, Danes between 20 and 30 years of age. If you select your sample subjects well, you only need a few hundreds in the sample, and by conducting your work on the sample, you can say something with high confidence about the thousands of people who the sample represents. There are some uncertainties, but overall you can be pretty confident and the uncertainties can be handled quite precisely and well. This is the beauty of statistics. The cost of being allowed to feel pretty confident in your conclusions on the bigger system is that you are very systematic and rigid about how you set up the whole thing, and this is basically what research design is all about. So let's take an example from coffee on how to try to take out a sample to estimate a parameter of a bigger system. If you have a bag of green coffee, which represents the bigger system. And you know, you want to know the moisture level. Here, the moisture is the parameter you want to estimate in the bigger system. And you want to estimate this for the entire bag. You don't need to measure the entire bag, but you will take a small amount, which is the sample, and expect that this sample predicts very well the moisture level of the entire bag. That's the beauty of statistics. You can get away with a really small piece of work to say something about a bigger system from which the sample is taking, taken. In this thought experiment, we assume homogeneity inside the bag, which I know is not completely realistic. The outer layer might be a bit drier than the inner uh, sometimes. But the, for the sake of purpose of this explanation, it is okay to assume to, uh, that there's a homogeneity in the bag uh, so that the 
all the coffee has the same moisture level in the bag. To make sure the point I'm really trying to make is clear. Now let's look at the problem called sample variation. And the problem of san sample variation can be explained like this. I just explained how you can take a sample from a bigger system and use the sample to estimate a parameter in the bigger system by measuring the parameter in your sample. The problem is that if you take a sample from the same bag a few times, you would get slightly different values each time samples are taken from the same bag. This is called sample variation and it is really funda a really fundamental problem in statistics, a pro problem that is handled, but a problem. If you take several samples from the same bag and you take the average of these samples, the average of the samples for that parameter is more reliable than the individual samples measured. The classical problem of a parameter estimate is handled by something called a 95% confidence interval, which maps out where the true average is estimated to be with 95% confidence, given the sample set you have measured. It takes into account the measured variation in your sample set and sets it up against how many samples you've taken. For this to end up being a narrow interval, which is what's needed if you want to use it for anything, it requires either a low variation on your data or a compensation by taking a lot of measurements or a lot of samples and measure. But an important assumption behind this measurement is that the parameter that you're trying to estimate is, exists at all. And also that the readings of each sample will start to follow a pattern called normal distribution or there are also other uh, types of, uh, of uh, distributions, but you need the, the, the average needs to kind of gather around some kind of maximum for this to make sense as a parameter. If the parameter doesn't really exist uh, as a true parameter, there's nothing really to estimate and therefore the 95% confidence in interval will never end up being narrow, such as it seems to be the case with a lot of the data we've seen uh, with the SCA copying protocol. Um, if we hope that this is indeed able to um, uh, estimate a, para a parameter which exists, and in this case, uh, case quality. And there, there's a separate episode about how pro problematic this assumption is and uh, why the SCA copying protocol doesn't seem to be a good tool for measuring a parameter because it seems like it doesn't really exist, the parameter it tries to measure. But let's return to something much simpler to go deeper in the explanation of what a parameter estimate is and how sample variation is a problem and how to handle it. If you have made an experiment on a particular green coffee, say in the processing stage, and each different treatment in the experiment is packed in a separate bag, so you've got different treatments and each treatment is packed in separate bags, then you expect to also be able to take a sample from each of the bags and compare the samples under the assumption that the difference between the samples taken reflects relevant differences in the bags. Because those, it's actually the bags that you are trying to say something about. So to repeat, you hope to be able to take samples from each bag and these samples will tell you something about the bigger system they are taken from, which in this case is the bag with the different treatments or the bags with the different treatments. If you measure the moisture of a single bag or if you measure the moisture of two bags from your green coffee processing experiment because you want to compare the bags to see how your experiment affected the moisture of your coffee, you face the challenge that the readings are a bit all over the place. This is expected to some degree, as you know the sample, that sample variation is a fundamental behavior of any sample. Even when measuring the same bag with the same apparatus several times in a row, you get a slightly different number every time. 
This is just the basic nature of most measurements. Intuitively, and as mentioned earlier, you can develop a more reliable assessment of the true value of the parameter by, by taking a few readings or a few samples and take the average of all your readings. You trust the average more than the individual measurements. This approach is great, and for most purposes, you don't need to go deeper than this. But the next level deeper in this problem shows itself when you ask the question, how many samples do I need to take to trust the average? And how, uh, how narrow would I like this interval to be? And the answer is, how precisely, precisely would you like to know the, uh, the real value of the moisture level in this experiment? And here comes the relevance of knowing the purpose of the measurements and the purpose with the project. Remember, form follows function. So the, the way you design, the way you conduct the research needs to uh, reflect the purpose of the experiment and your readings. Let's say in your production you have a lower acceptable threshold for moisture of coffee. Uh, let's say it's 9%. And all your readings that you are taking from your samples uh, are around 11%, with only 0.1 to 0.3% difference between the samples uh, measurements you do. You don't really worry, and you can probably get away with just doing one reading and trust it, since the variance between the readings are so small, and the average seems uh, safely far away from the th critical threshold. But if you create samples for a development time modulation experiment, you have a tolerance, tolerance threshold of plus minus one actron in a uh, roast, uh, roast degree. And your color reader gives you reading variance of plus minus, per, for example, 0 0.8 actron between readings on the same sample. You need to do several readings to trust the average as the variance between the reading is big compared to the practical purpose of the project from which the tolerance range is derived. If you roast for production, you might have a tolerance of plus minus five action rather than plus minus one for research purposes, in which case you could get away with just one color reading, still with the same variation of the apparatus of 0 0.8 action. And only in rare occasions you would be, uh, you would make a, uh, it would make you to suspect that you have exceeded the threshold and therefore you would need to, to test it a few more times. So you can see that the practical difference which is, uh, um, is reflected in the tolerance range that you have, where in research it was plus minus one and for, produc pr for production it could be plus minus five. The practical difference is connected more with the purpose of the project than the equipment. So the state-of-the-art method for parameter estimation is called the 95% confidence interval, which is a calculation that takes into account the natural variation of the reading you are doing based on the variance of the samples you are taking and how many samples you've taken and, given, uh, and gives you an interval in which you can expect the true parameter to be, as mentioned before as well. If you do an experiment, you have another layer of this problem. You can compare two sample averages when you know that each average is constructed based on a measurement that vary this much. Here it's even more important to evaluate how much you trust the average because you could end up making a wrong conclusion if you don't pay attention to the precision with which the sample represents the background phenomena that you are trying to estimate. And knowing that you have, you have sample variation makes you really suspicious of any numbers coming from the readings. Let's say you have experimented with green coffee processing and you want to know if the different types of processings would give coffee with different moisture content. Then you would read the moisture of the two bags where you've got, let's say, two different treatments and you would uh, take a sample from each of the two bags. Let's say that bag one has the moisture level in the first sample that you read of 11.2 and taking a sample from the other bag would show you a moisture level of 11.3. So only 0.1% difference. Do you trust that they are indeed different, the two bags? Your problem is that there can be two different sources for the difference 
uh, that you see. One possibility is that they are indeed different in moisture as reflected in exactly these readings. One conclusion could be that the difference in processing shifts the moisture level from 11.2 to 11.3. That could be one hypothesis that one treatment makes it just slightly more moist than the other treatment. But the other possibility is that there is really no fundamental difference in moisture between the two bags, but the fact that bags, bag one reads 11.2 from your sample and, and bag 2 reads 11.3 is purely based on sample variation. Even if you did several sample readings uh, from the same bag, you would get small differences between readings and these readings could be just that, sample variation, pure randomness. But as you keep taking samples from a bigger system, the differences between samples will stay close to the average of the true value of the parameter even though, of course, sometimes by coincidence, you get a reading that is a bit far from the average compared to most of the other readings. There are often some outliers, but they are still expected and can be handled as long as most of the readings concentrate around the true average. This behavior of a reading is technical, technically called a stochastic parameter, as far as I remember from my education, when the sample behavior is a bit all over the place but you still trust that the average of these readings reflects the real value of what you are trying to estimate. So in the example of the green coffee processing experiment, the question is, given the set of samples we have from each of the bags that, we, that were treated differently, do we think that the real value of the moisture level in each bag is different or not? If it is really different, it would have been driven by the differences in treatment of each of the coffees. If they are not really different, the different treatments do not lead to coffee with different moisture levels, but all the differences in the readings you see of each sample is just random sample variation and not an expression of how the treatment has changed anything in the moisture level of the beans. Given all the measurements we've done on both bags, what do we trust? The way this is solved is a bit backwards, <laughs> a bit aligned also with Popper. We can't prove that they are different, as we would never know if our readings are, are really, if they reflect sample variation and randomness or not. It might also be real differences. What do we uh, trust? We can never verify and make sure we have said the last word about the theory and the reality it describes, as Popper would say, but we can assume that there really is no difference. If we just, from a pure thought experiment, if we see data with a lot of variation, we can assume, as the first approach to these data, that there is no difference between uh, any of the samples, so that no treatment has actually caused a difference at all. And then we'll just interpret the actual samples that we see uh, across all the bags, and which is across all the treatments, we'll just see it as sample variation. And then we can ca calculate the probability of the given sample and the uh, magnitude of variation. We can just uh, calculate the probability that they behave like they do, uh, do based on pure sample variation. And then we can calculate the probability of the given differences that we see, assuming that it's just sample variation. As I mentioned, it is much more likely to get sample readings around the average value of the sample than it is to get readings far from the average value. And remember, it is still possible to get re uh, random readings far away from the average. It's just not very likely. And the probability of those outliers you can calculate. So the solution to the problem is to calculate the probability of the actual differences you got in your samples when taking the samples from the two bags as if they were coming from one and the same bag. And this probability is, if sufficiently low, if the outcomes just seem to be deviating too far from the overall average of all the readings, then you trust that the shift you see in the data um, comes 
from a shift in the treatment. The treatment, if the differences are indeed so different that you see, the probability of this being sample variation is just so uh, low that you trust the opposite, which is you trust that the treatment has caused this shift in readings between um, the bags uh, in, in your uh, data set. And calculating the probability of the differences you see is, uh, given that it's sample variation, is, it, that is a technical calculation that is typically re uh, referred to as the p-value in statistics. And the p-value estimates exactly this. What is the probability of seeing the differences we actually see in the data if they are caused by sample variation alone and not treatment? Technically, this, technically, this assumption of no real difference between experimental samples is called the H0 hypothesis um, or the null hypothesis. And P is the probability of the differences you see in the actual data, given that the H0 is true, which is that it's just sample variation causing all the differences, which means that there's really no background uh, difference because all the differences are driven by sample variation alone. If this value, if this probability is very low, which is technically um, and conceptually defined as 5%, if the p-value, which is the probability of the samples you see, given that um, there is really no treatment that drives the difference, if this probability is below 5%, you trust that the differences you see are driven by the experiential parameters and not sample variation. So we trust that the experiment, experiment itself had the effect on moisture difference and not that the differences we saw was based on random sample variation. This is not a proof that we are right, just as Popper would never approve, but we just trust it and dare to assume, given the actual data in this particular experiment, that we trust the opposite. We trust that the treatment has moved the data and not just uh, sample variation, because it's just not very likely, given just sample variation, to get the differences that we see in our data. A p-value of 5% is the conventional cutoff point in general uh, in statistic, statistics, which is called a statistically significant difference if it is met in a particular data set where you compare samples. So under 5% and you trust the difference to be driven by the experiential parameters, but if you get 1% or even 0.1%, it is even better, which is something we've seen in many our of our projects uh, and even in our sensory data. The meaning of evidence is exactly that if the p-value is below 5%, you trust the difference you see, even though you know that it can never be proven as there is still a chance that the differences you see are driven by sample variation and not a true shift. This is an uncertainty you have to live with as a scientist. And this is an important point when talking about the relationship between scientific evidence and a more philosophical concept of truth. The data above is based on a typical measurement of a stochastic model where you try to estimate parameters that typically behave as what is called a normal distribution. But you can also have other types of data and apply the same logic. In discriminative tests in uh, cuppings, you are testing the skills of a copper to differentiate samples, and there are two possible outcomes. Either the copper is indeed able to differentiate the samples, or the copper is not. Your problem is that if you force a person to cop 10 triangles, your problem is that they have to make a decision for each triangle they face, and how would you decide if a person is correctly able to differentiate between two samples when they often are pointing out the right cup based on pure chance? If you face data with a copper who is not able to differentiate at all and other data from a copper who is able to differentiate correctly, you will net not end up with a sample set of cups where the unskilled copper will have all the triangles wrong and the skilled copper will have all the triangles right you will end up with a data set where the unskilled copper will have a, have 
several of them correct by coincidence, close to 33%, and the skill cover would have most of them correct. Aligned with the previous logic of the H0 hypothesis, you can calculate the probability of having the given set of samples correct by chance for each of the covers, and the copper who is arriving below the 5% mark here is interpreted as being able to differentiate correctly as the copper has proven to deviate from random choices, and the copper who fails to present data with less than 5% possibility of a random correct answer will be interpreted, uh, interpreted uh, to not be skilled enough to really differentiate. Notice again, here we could also be wrong. If somebody presents data with, say, 4% chance of correct answer by random or by coincidence, we would trust that they are able to differentiate. But it could still be a rare coincidence. This reminds me that somebody has calculated the time it would take a monkey to come up with the entire tragedy of Hamlet story by coincidence if you let it randomly tap the keys on a keyboard. It can be done by coincidence. It is just not very likely. And if you see data that are not very likely to, uh, to, uh, to be uh, by coincidence, you tend to trust the opposite, that it is not a coincidence. Even though you could be wrong. If a monkey spends, I don't know, 800 years in solitude with a typewriter and came back with the tragedy of Hamlet, you would suspect it being a coincidence because the monkey is not able to create stories like that and, uh, and type them uh, uh, down. But you could also suspect that somebody has been cheating, right? Um, so this is a practical solution to the problem of whether it is possible to prove a theory or not. We can test if we trust it, even if we can't prove it. This is the best we can do as scientists.